Hi, what I have on the workbench today is a four-way power divider and combiner that operates between 500 MHz and 6 GHz. A quick shout out to the good folks at Verbal Microwave for sending me this. Verbal Microwave is a US-based company. They are actually in New Jersey, which is only a few hours away from where I live. In this day and age, when everything is manufactured overseas, I definitely appreciate seeing some quality products that are still made in the United States. If you are interested in locally sourced quality RF and microwave frequency products, be sure to check out their website following the link provided in the video description below. Besides the power divider, they also send me a directional coupler, and this one here is good for frequencies between 500 MHz and 20 GHz with a 20 decibel coupling. I'll have to think of some experiments to do with this one in a future video. Today though, we're going to concentrate on this 4-way power divider and combiner, and we will do some real-world testing, and of course, take a look at its internals a little bit later. And by the way, these RF products from reputable sources are usually not cheap if we buy them new. But unlike some random eBay stuff, especially those from unknown manufacturers, you do get very detailed data sheets with performance characteristics you can rely on. RF power dividers are very useful devices, and they roughly fall into two categories resistive divider and Wilkinson divider. These devices we're talking about here don't have phase differences in the split signals, and the R devices also split signals but uh, also cause phase shift in the output signal, such as a ballot. Anyway, you can easily tell whether a divider is resistive or Wilkinson by just looking at the specs. Resistive dividers are relatively simple, and they can operate over a wide frequency range, from DC all the way upwards to sometimes tens of gigahertz. They are also very small in size. But there are a few drawbacks as well. The first is obviously the insertion loss. For a two-port resistive splitter, the output signal will be 6 dB down compared to the input signal. This 6 dB is the insertion loss. If you do the math, 3 dB is half of the value, so the other 3 dB loss is unfortunately dissipated as heat in the divider resistors themselves. And because of this heat dissipation, it also limits how much power can go through the splitter. So typically, resistive dividers are only suitable for low power scenarios. Another major issue of resistive divider is that the isolation between ports are poor. You only get 6 dB isolation between any of the ports. Wilkinson dividers use quarter-wave transmission lines, and in an ideal situation, there is no resistive loss. Therefore, in a 1 to 2 split, each port gets half of the original signal, which is 3 dB below the input. While there is an isolation resistor at the output, because the signals at either side of the outputs are in phase, there is no current flowing through the resistor. Therefore, Wilkinson dividers can handle much higher power. Another key advantage of a Wilkinson divider is the high isolation among the ports. It is not uncommon for Wilkinson dividers to achieve at least 20 dB isolation. Now, just by looking at it, given the size of this device, we can definitely tell this is obviously a Wilkinson divider, as a resistive divider is much more compact. And of course, we can also confirm it with the specifications. The minimum frequency you can see here is 500 MHz, which is typical for a Wilkinson divider, given the physical constraints of the quarter wavelength transmission line dimensions, and the maximum frequency is 6 GHz for this device. The bandwidth is actually very wide. Now, I forgot to mention earlier, one of the drawbacks of a Wilkinson divider is that it is more difficult to achieve wider bandwidth. And to get a wider bandwidth, usually it involves adding multiple cascading stages of the quarter wave transmission line structures, and perhaps using some kind of taper line structures as well. So we'll have to open it up later to see what techniques are used in this particular device. And here you can see that the insertion loss is actually very minimal for this device. And remember, this is a four-way divider, so that in the ideal situation, the insertion loss is 6 dB. As indicated in the spec itself, the numbers you see here are the extra loss beyond that 6 dB figure. The isolation is specced at 25 dB, which is very good. And one of the unique features of a four-way divider compared to a two-way divider is that you actually have two sets of isolation characteristics. If you take a look at the figures here, you will see that the isolation between certain ports are higher than others, 
And this is again due to the construction, which we'll have to take a look a little bit later on. With the specs away, let's do some real world measurements. For the measurements here, I'm going to use a light VNA, and this light VNA I have here can operate all the way up to 6.3 gigahertz, which is going to be perfect because the device we have here operates between 500 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. First, we'll need to do calibration, of course. And uh, you can see we have already set the start frequency to be 500 megahertz and the stop at uh, 6 gigahertz. So this time I'm going to actually, instead of uh, calibrating at a port here, I'm going to put a SMA cable here and we'll calibrate at the end of the SMA cable. So let's uh, take a look at the calibration here. Calibrate. So first we're going to calibrate open. And this is our open adapter. So let's do open. And next we'll calibrate short. Okay, so now we're done with the calibration. And let's save it. Here we're actually doing two measurements with this setup. So let me explain the setup here first. The port 1 of the Nano VNA is connected to the input of the divider, and you can see the output from the divider. Three of the ports are terminated, and this one is connected to the port number 2. So on the trace here, you can see we have two lines. Let me just uh, zoom in a little bit more. The line above, the cyan line, that's our S2 one, which measures the insertion loss. So you can see here. So I want you to observe the number here on the top right corner, and that currently is at minus 6.13 dB. So that is our insertion loss. And you can see from 500 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz, that insertion loss stayed relatively close to what is spec. And the yellow trace you see here, that's the return loss looking into the input port of this splitter. And according to the spec, it should stay mostly under 15 decibels, which we definitely can see that is indeed what we're getting here. Now, towards the higher end, it gets a little bit of uh, inaccurate. That's due to the limitation of this nano VNA. So now I change the setup a little bit. As you can see here, the input port is terminated, and also the port 3, port 4 are both terminated as well. So right now the results you are seeing here is the S11 and S21 between port 1 and port 2. Let me just zoom it in a little bit. So the S11 here is essentially the yellow line that's when looking into port 1, what is the return loss. So it is a little bit of a uh, busy here, so let me turn off that S11 trace here. So now we're left with this uh, S2 one, which is the isolation between port 1 and port 2. And you can see here the isolation is really good. And right now at this point, we're at minus 24.6 decibels down. And uh, in some frequency ranges, you can see that actually it's way down into the 30, 40 decibel range. So that isolation is very good. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we do have two numbers of this isolation. One is between port 1 and 2, or port 3 and 4. These are one set of the Wilkinson divider, and there's another set of uh, isolation is essentially between the other ports, and that's a different number and supposed to be higher. So let's take a look at that as well. Now, as you can see here, I just swapped the port isolation measurement to be between 1 and 4. So this number, as you can see on the nano BNA here, and here you can see the isolation plot here is of a slightly different shape compared to the port 1 and 2. And according to spec, this is uh, supposed to be a little bit lower than that 
between 1 and 2. And indeed, you can see that for the majority part, the average isolation is at 28, 29 decibels down. So definitely it's a little bit lower than what we saw earlier between port 1 and 2. Now I have turned on the Smith chart, you can see that pretty much all the data points are clustered around that 50 ohm range. So this means it's a very good impedance matching throughout the frequency range. Now, of course, the Smith chart measurement is a little bit tricky as if I, for example, just move things a little bit, you can see that the trace shifts quite a bit. But uh, nevertheless, you do get an idea of the impedance matching here on this splitter. Although the divider is specified with a frequency range between 500 megahertz and 6 gigahertz, it doesn't really mean that you cannot use it outside that frequency range. It just means that the performance such as port isolation and the impedance can no longer be guaranteed. And just for my curiosity, I'm looking at the frequency currently between 100 megahertz and 500 megahertz. That's way outside of the spec. And you can see here, let me just uh, zoom in a little bit more. And actually it's very touchy again. But as you can see, our isolation right now, we're measuring the port one and port four. And it's, yeah, definitely degraded quite a bit. Now it's, uh, you can see 11 and 12 dBs down versus 30 dB down. But we still have some decent isolation and uh, the impedance is actually not that bad. The green line, that's our impedance, that's a 50 ohm. And you can see that towards the lower end is definitely no longer a resistive load, but it uh, definitely can still be used if you understand the actual characteristics here. Now we're looking at the same plots for the adjacent ports. You can see that the isolation definitely gets a lot worse. It's only minus 6 dB down. But again, it is uh, still useful as long as you understand the ramifications. And just for completeness, let's take a look at the characteristics between the input port and one of the output port. And remember, right now the frequency is between 100 MHz and 500 MHz. You can see that looking into the main signal port on this side is no longer resistive at uh, this lower frequency. But uh, in a pinch, you can still use this to do your measurement. Just understanding these mismatches are happening here. And we still have some level of isolation at about 6 dB, 7 dB down. So obviously you cannot do any serious measurements, but you can still use it to observe your signal. Now it's time for the teardown. You can see I have already removed the majority of the screws from the bottom here. Wow, this is definitely a lot of screws. We still have a few left, so let me just remove those and we'll take a look. All right, we're in. Look at how beautiful this thing is. As I mentioned earlier, these RF devices are in general very expensive. Besides being low volume and hand assembled, the material used is also expensive as well. For example, for these devices working in the gigahertz range, the PCB used inside are guaranteed not your ordinary FR4 PCBs. Although it is not specified, I suspect it is using some kind of a Rogers PCB substrates, which are specifically designed for high frequency uses. Now, this Rogers PCB material has very low dielectric loss at high frequencies. Now let's take a closer look at the circuitry here. As we suspected earlier, this power divider indeed uses the general Wilkinson power divider designs. And to achieve the high bandwidth, you can see we have multiple sections of these features cascaded with isolation resistors in between. And also you notice that the traces are also tapered as we suspected earlier. So this helps improve the overall bandwidth. The actual designs of these RF devices typically uses some kind of commercial finite element analysis and simulation software. The one I'm familiar with is HFSS, which is a electromagnetic simulation tool, quite popular for microwave frequency products design and simulation. Essentially, the device is consist of three of these Wilkinson dividers, and their constructions are ever so slightly different. Now, rest assured, in RF design, everything has its purpose, including where the RF absorbing paths are placed and where these screws are mounted and which ones are missing. So, for example, this one is not used. I'm sure it has its design considerations as well. Now, I'm not going to take it apart any further as I do want to preserve the specs of this divider, as I'm sure I'll be using it quite a bit in the future. 
But to broaden bandwidth, sometimes you do see parallel Wilkinson structures placed on either side of the PCB. Now, I'm not sure if that is what's happening here, as I can't see the other side, and I don't want to take it out. But you do see we have these soldering joints that comes out from the other side of the PCB. So this is one here, and there are other two here. So there is a possibility we may have additional features on the other side, although I'm not quite sure, as the other two paths, you can see that we don't have these features. So this one, we don't have anything coming from the other side, and neither does this path. And by the way, now you can see why the port isolation figures are different depending on which port you are measuring. In this design, port 1, 2, and port 3, 4 are symmetrical designs. So the isolation characteristics between port 1 and 2 or port 3 and 4 would be similar. But the signals go through a different path. If you are, say, talking about port 1 and port 3, port 2 and port 3, or port 1 and port 4. And in this design, the isolation is higher between those ports versus the adjacent ports. So sometimes you see a four-way splitter is deliberately used, even though it is only used for dividing the source into two signals. And high isolation is the primary reason in that scenario. Of course, there is the cost of the additional 3 dB signal loss due to the presence of the other ports. Oh, you know another reason why these RF devices are so expensive? Look at these isolation resistors. The values of those depends on the design are mostly non-standard. The last ones are typically 100 ohms, but the ones in between are probably not. And these resistors have to be very precise, so they're not your off-the-shelf resistors and are most likely specially made and laser trimmed. So after this video, I hope you have a better understanding of how a Wilkinson power divider works and what goes into the design of these RF devices in general. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up with you next time.